So while you are moving forward, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about our two presenters. Um, Dr. Danny Avula is the dire Deputy Director of the Richmond City Health Department. In addition to his role as a preventive medicine physician, he also serves as a board certified pediatrician and continues to practice clinically as a pediatric hospitalist in two area hospitals. After graduating from University of Virginia, he attended medical school at VCU School of Medicine, completed a pediatric resident at Virginia Commonwealth University, followed by a preventative medicine residency at John Hopkins University where he also received a master's in public health. He's been appointed as the affiliate faculty member of VCU, where he regularly serves as student advisor and preceptor to students in the MD, MPH, MPA, and MURP programs. At home, he loves spending time with his wife and five kids. And do you have a dog? No? No dog. Um, and um, is committed to uh, working within the community. Our other presenter is Amy Popovich. Okay, here she is. Amy Popovich is the resource is at the resource centers, and she is the supervisor. Let me start that sentence one more time. So <laughs> forgive me. Very nervous for some reason. Um, no, is the resource center's supervisor of the Richmond City Health D District. She oversees five community resource centers and has been primarily responsible for the cultivation of community advocates. Amy also serves as an adjunct faculty member of Virginia Commonwealth University School of Nursing, where she instructs and mentors nursing students during their community health rotation. Do you have a dog? No dog as well. It's very problematic. She completed her undergraduate degree and, course, and graduate coursework in nursing at the University of Virginia, completing her BSN and Master's in Science Nursing with an emphasis on community and public health. Is that enough? Perfect, perfect. They've asked, oh, I'm sorry? Okay, we'll work on the doc. Um, so they've asked for the session to be really interactive, so if you have a question, please raise your hand. I will try my best to run around and um, give you the microphone. Thank you, David. Appreciate that. Um, very glad to be with you all this afternoon. Uh, for Amy and I, this is our first interaction uh, with this organization, and so we wanted to start by getting a feel of who you guys are, why you're here, um, and that, that'll help us kind of tailor this conversation, too. So, um, you know, David has read our bios, and so you've heard a little bit about us. Um, some of you may have looked at the title of this presentation um, and said, oh, that's a bold title, or that's uh, aspirational, or, or maybe even hyperbolic. And to that, I would say um, we really went to Denver, and so I had to come up with a good title for you guys, and hopefully that, what, that sold uh, the, the conference uh, the, the, the folks putting together the, the conference, and hopefully it told you to be here. But I will say um, that in many ways that you'll hear about over the course of this presentation, we actually believe that to be true. Um, we actually feel like we have uh, been a part of an effort in our city uh, that has changed the way that our city thinks about public housing, that, that has changed the way that uh, we look to empower folks, residents in public housing. Um, and it's been really exciting for us. So we're gonna share that, some of that with you today. We're gonna start, um, this actually, this kind of video montage just got sent to us by one of our funding partners this morning. So we're gonna start with that, just to give you a sense of what the resource centers are. Um, Amy's gonna play that. Uh, it's a little bit cheesy, don't tell our funders that, but it'll give you an idea of, of what we're doing. And then we'll take some time to just introduce um, yourselves to us, uh, and we'll go from there. Several years ago, a study of city and county health rankings found the city of Richmond to be in the bottom five in the state for most health indicators. When the staff of the Richmond City Health Department and the Redevelopment and Housing Authority learned that some of the highest clusters of teen pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections were in the city's public housing communities, they teamed up and went to work. With creative thinking and pooling their talents and assets, they opened a health resource center or mini clinic at Fairfield Court. This teamwork engaged others 
and led to three more centers in other public housing communities. Each center provides women's health screenings and services, health education, and referrals to medical homes at area safety net providers. The health department provides the management and staffing, including a public health nurse, nurse practitioner, and a medical assistant for each center. The housing authority provides the clinic space, utilities, and building maintenance. It also helps by connecting the center staff with residents through the tenant councils. The center staff takes a relationship-based approach to helping the residents with their health care needs. And each center employs a community advocate from the neighborhood to introduce the center to the residents, who are typically wary of outsiders. The team also co-hosted creative outreach activities, such as health fairs, cookouts, and back-to-school events that help break the ice. This past year alone, the centers provided almost 3,000 patient visits, and the vast majority of teen residents and female patients received information about birth control. The result? The number of teen pregnancies in Richmond has decreased by 34% since the first center opened. This collaboration has gained national recognition. Both the National Association of County and City Health Officials and the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials have lauded the impact of this team. The VCU School of Nursing has also been engaged, enabling its students to learn about healthcare in an urban setting. One student became so passionate about her experience that she was recently hired to work in one of the centers. There are many examples of people whose lives have been changed through the center's staff and resources. So um, we'll get more in depth on that in, in the presentation. And as I said, you know, for us, this is our first interaction with this organization. And um, it's really exciting because we feel like we've been doing this work on an island in Richmond. There aren't a lot of other folks, you know, outside of us and, and the public housing division there um, that have really engaged this conversation. And so already in our few short hours here, we've met people like you who are doing this exact same thing in other parts of the country. Um, and so we'd love to, to get to know and, and hear from you guys now. So I'm gonna pass this mic around, and if you would just say who you are, where you're from, and kind of where in this conversation um, you connect, or what, what drew you to this specific presentation. My name is Gail Van Loan, and I live at Quig Newton. We have a health center at Quig Newton. I'm also, yeah, it's Northwest Denver. Um, and I'm also on the Consumer Advisory Board for the Coalition for the Homeless. My name is Shirley Chavis. <laughs> I know. My name is Shirley Chavez, and I am a resident at Quig Newton. And my interest for that community is to help make it better. I know I can't do it alone, so anyone who comes in to help build the community that they live in and be proud about what they put into the community because the community will always give out. So I am very glad that I live at Quig Newton. Uh, it's blessed me. I came from South Denver. My husband was murdered, and I had nowhere to go, didn't know what to do, and they took me in, and I've been trying to do the best I can with the community. So I'm proud of that community. My name's Robin Parker. I live at Greg Newton. Um, I've been there four years, and just in the last six, eight months, I've gotten involved with Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, which Diane Ray is the case manager. And we do um, food banks, and we had a yard sale. We do wee bowling, Zumba, and there's 380 buildings or homes. You'd think more people would be getting involved, but they don't. So how do you do that? That's the million dollar question. How do you do it? My name is Javon Muhammad. I'm from San Francisco. I work at a clinic in a, new, a newer FQHC in Marin City. I'm a midwife and a program coordinator there. I'm Patricia Hayes and I am from East Tennessee State University. I'm a faculty member there. 
we currently have a hrsa grant that is supporting the a new nurse managed clinic that's providing comprehensive primary health care services to our local public housing authority residents as well as it's funding an interprofessional clinical training for our students there thank you good afternoon my name is Cynthia Sierra and I'm from Manna Community Health Center which is in the south shore of Massachusetts city of Quincy surrounding towns about 15 minutes south of Boston and with a title like how investing in public housing residents change the city how could you not come this afternoon thank you Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Andy Teitelman. I'm with the Chicago Housing Authority in resident services and interested in models of how health and public housing can work together. I'm Bonnie Erickson. I'm a nurse at a housing unit in Fargo, North Dakota for the chronically homeless, and I'm just looking for new ideas. Ah, you put me on a hot spot. Can you hear me now? Yep. All right. My name is Alexei Ochola. I'm with uh, the Maestro Community Health Centers in San Diego. I've been a board member for a few years. Hi, I'm Taronda. I'm a service coordinator at Denver Housing Authority. So we see some of the resources stuff. We do have a health set, but this looks like this is like ongoing, like it's on site, which is pretty awesome. And that would be something we can do, like more community health fairs, but something that is like on site on a daily basis. Because the one that we do have is just monthly. So this would be awesome to have that there at the facility. My name is Lonnie Ferrero, and I'm a service coordinator also through Denver Housing Authority. Um, and just to add to what Taronda said, um, it would also be nice to have at all of our sites a community health worker that is either a resident or someone in the neighborhood to assist them because um, we're all throughout Denver. So there are some deserts in there um, for health care and other resources. So it would be nice to have someone empathize but then also provide those resources that they have been educated on. So. <coughs> I'm Corey Peltz. I'm with Denver Housing Authority. I work in the Sun Valley neighborhood. Uh, I'm just interested in learning about other public housing authorities and how they run. So. Uh, <coughs> I'm Chad Rohr. I'm a service coordinator at uh, Columbine Homes. Um, uh, primarily working with families, although um, I have a mixed population, uh, senior disabled families. And uh, like Corey, um, well, and I'm going to echo all the other DHA folks here. Uh, but I'm just interested in hearing from other uh, housing authorities. Hi, I'm April, and I'm from uh, Maryroy. I'm the vice president for Maryroy Apartments. I'm Marisa. I'm an AmeriCorps VISTA member at Reading Housing Authority. Um, I was assigned this um, workshop for the evaluation, so just a friendly reminder to fill those out um, before you go. But um, I can already tell that this is a relevant um, workshop for, for my AmeriCorps position. So. Hi, I'm Marlene Jansel. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I'm a manager in an FQHC. And I'm here just to kind of learn and compare notes to other FQHCs. Uh, hi, my name is Vital Tsiaunarais. I am connected with La Casa Quig Newton Family Counseling Center. I work as a bilingual therapist, and I'm expecting to hear miraculous things with, with the title you gave for this. So. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Rudy Cooper. I'm the Public Housing Clinic Coordinator for Charles Drew Health Center in Omaha, Nebraska. <clears throat> uh, we have a new initiative. We've put clinics in the public housing towers themselves. Uh, this is a new initiative for us. We've done this now since January, about five months. This is my first symposium, and I'm here to learn anything that I can that will help me be successful. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is John Crow. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I work with Mr. Yana Rice at the Quig Newton Family Counseling Center. Um, let's see. Been a, came up through social work for the last 23 years. 
So in addition to wanting to see what's going on at other public housing um, centers, also to going back to my roots as a child welfare worker in Philadelphia, I wanted to hear some good news from the East Coast. Hello, my name is D Diana Ray, and I'm a, uh, I work for the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless at Quig Newton. Uh, I'm a case manager there. Uh, I've worked for the coalition for about 16 years already. Um, I can relate to uh, this program because it, uh, I was hired, I used to live at Quig Newton, uh, and I was hired as an outreach worker at that time, and um, I've been there ever since, and uh, I love the residents that I serve, and uh, it's just a pleasure doing what I'm doing, and like I said, I, I just love what I do, so. And, yeah. Hi, my name is Kristen Steimanoff. Um, I'm with Health Outreach Partners. We're a national organization that provides training and support for um, mostly HRSA-supported health centers to help figure out how to build the best outreach programs and services to meet their underserved community members. And I'm just really excited to be here and learn as much as I can about public health and housing collaborations. My name's Sarah Russell, and I'm from the Burlington Housing Authority in Vermont, and I'm the Assistant Director of Resident Service Programs there. And I'm here today to learn new ways that we can enhance our wellness program. Hi, my name is Twin Tran. I'm um, with APCHO. We're the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations. It's a membership of um, community health uh, centers that serve Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, and Native Hawaiians. And it's my first um, health center and public housing symposium, so I'm looking forward to learning as much as I can. So looking forward to the session. I'm Mike Hanley. I'm executive director at United Neighborhood Centers in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Uh, we're a multi-service community service agency uh, providing child care centers, senior centers, uh, crisis programs for families, supportive housing programs for chronic homeless individuals and families as well. And I'm really here to try and learn about the intersection between primary care and the social determinants of health, which we've been dealing with for the past 90 years. And so we're looking for successful models. We're an active uh, discussion and uh, building collaboratives within uh, northeastern Pennsylvania. Good afternoon. I'm Romanita Ford, Director of Community Affairs and Government Relations. I'm from Miami, Florida. I work for a community health center, Community Health of South Florida. We're one of the largest in the state of uh, Florida. We have partnered with the affordable housing and we took on a model called the SPEC model. Um, first, we had to build their trust. That was the most important thing. Once they saw our presence there, that made all the difference in the world. You say, what is SPEC? Strength, people, empowerment, and of course the community. And we call our um, program CCI, a Community Health Initiative Program. And I'm here to build on it and, and see what we can get back and take back to Miami and South Miami Dade. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Sylvia Dayton Jones. I'm the director for the National Institutes for Training. We design and develop training for community health centers and also for the residents of public housing. So anytime someone's going to present information that talks about investing in public housing and residents, then I want to hear the information that you're sharing. Good afternoon. My name is Angela Fletcher. I'm the deputy director for our housing management division for Denver Housing Authority. So I'm just interested in this model to see what it would take to replicate at possibly some of our properties. Uh, my name is Salva Chavez. I'm a resident and also president of TAPIS. And I'm here to uh, gather some information and take it back home to my neighbors. Hi, my name is Jim Luisi. I'm from <clears throat> the North End Waterfront Health Center in Boston. I'm also representing the National Association of Community Health Centers. I'm the Speaker of the House. Uh, we are trying to open up a uh, public housing health center in the largest public housing development in all of New England. So this is all new to me, and I'm just here to learn. 
Hi, I'm Annette Ballou with Heart of Texas Community Health Center out of Waco, Texas. I'm the controller there and um, just here to learn more information. Good afternoon, Alan Patterson, Chief Financial and Operating Officer of Heart of Texas Community Health Center, and uh, we're here to get the, the best practices. And last but certainly not least. <laughs> Hello, my name is Angelo Crow. I'm a resident of Basel of Sun Valley Homes. I'm here to learn about the achievements of others and what can we do to implement this program and many other programs in our community. Well, thank you all for indulging us. I hope what um, that potentially accomplished for you guys is to know who you need to connect with after this, and it certainly has done that for me. I think there's a handful of people um, in this audience that I really uh, will seek out and you know get input from, from residents and other people who are just at the beginning stages of this and other folks who have been doing this for a while. So um, thank you for making the time commitment to do that. We'll get started here. Um, you know, the, the overall organization of this will really just kind of a little bit of background and history about how these resource centers came to be in existence. And then we're really gonna focus on two main components. And, and there's lots of other stuff we can talk about. And, and, and if you guys wanna go a different direction, we're happy to do that. The two main components we'd really like to talk about is the power of the academic partnerships with both, um, well, different branches of Virginia Commonwealth University um, mainly, but also interns from University of Richmond, Virginia Union University, um, a lot of the universities that are in the Richmond area. And then, the bulk of this is really gonna focus on our community health worker model. The community advocates, we call them, you know that they're branded in different ways every community you go to, and, um, and so we'll, uh, we'll delve into that. So, background, I wanna start just talking a little bit about Richmond. Um, Richmond City is the capital of Virginia. Population is about 205,000 folks. Um, I have lived in Richmond since 2000 when I moved there to go to medical school and fell in love with the city. You know, it is uh, a beautiful city that's got a, a, a big river running through it. It's actually, um, I, we say in Richmond, I don't know if that's true because I wonder if, if this is uh, true in Colorado, but um, the James River running right through the center of Richmond City, it's the only urban center in the country that has class five rapids running right through uh, an, urban, an urban center. So a lot of similarities to Richmond, which you wouldn't expect to, to what's happening here in Colorado, um, but it is, uh, you'll see in 2012, Outside Magazine named us the, the best river town in America. Um, so, and, then, and this quote really kind of captures where we are. People say living in Richmond is good because it's two hours from everything, the mountains, the ocean, Washington, D.C. That's cool, but it's also one minute from itself. And so that really captures kind of where we are as a city and what our identity is, that we're, we're growing into a place where, man, there's a lot of good things happening in this city. And it's venues like this where we can share that and also connect and, and, and draw even more good ideas about what's happening around the country. So we're really happy to be here. Why, you know, even though Richmond is an amazing place to be, there are a lot of issues with this city as well. As some of you may know, it was the capital of the Confederacy. It was the center of the slave trade. There's a deep and tragic history in that city um, with race relations and things that continue to um, plague us. You know, policies that have uh, been levied through the last, you know, 50, 60 years that continue to play out. Um, in, in race relations, in, in business and government relations. Um, and so there's a, a lot of brokenness in our city, and, and that's part of what draws us in public health to this work, to address those issues of justice and of racial reconciliation that are so needed in our community. Um, and, you know, we, the video also captured this too, that, that when Robert Wood Johnson put out those city and county health rankings, and we were... Uh, okay, sorry about that. Um, when RWJ put out those city and county health rankings, and we were 125th out of 131 localities in our state, um, that was a little bit shocking to us. You know, we knew we were an urban center, we knew we had a lot of poverty, we knew there were a lot of issues, um, but it, it just, it, it put a fire under us. And so what happened when I joined the health department about four years ago, um, we decided that we wanted to take the health indicators where we were the most out of whack with the state, the things where we were two times the incidence or greater with health indicators um, as compared to other localities in the state. And so, uh, you know, we looked at our STI rate and our infant mortality rate and our lead poisoning. And so we, we came up with a cluster of indicators that we really wanted to impact and that we really wanted to work on. And we GIS mapped all of the very specific incidences of those um, health statuses. And what we found looked something like this. We saw clusters of disease. As you would expect, this isn't crazy, but it was really powerful to see it on a map. 
where when we mapped all of these individual health occurrences, we could just see clear aggregations over our public housing communities. And so that started the conversation in our mind. Well, maybe we should talk to public housing about impacting health in those specific communities. So we, um, we went over to the Richmond uh, Redevelopment and Housing Authority, RRHA, which is a public housing authority in, in Virginia, in Richmond. Um, and they said, wow, that is powerful. Why don't we give you vacant apartment units and see if you can start to you know, put some health education, some, maybe some health services in them. And right about that time, we also got uh, a, a federal grant, a, t a Title X family planning expansion grant that said, we'd love for you to look at ways to get outside of your four walls in the health department. How, how can you take this out to the community? And so the alignment of these conversations was, was really amazing. And, and we um, said, OK, well, let's take family planning services to, uh, to public housing. But we also knew that there were many other health needs in addition to family planning. And uh, so we took it to the community at that point. We started focus groups. We really got input from our residents. We said, what are the pressing needs that you guys see? Um, and, and part of that was a dialogue because um, I think there was a need for us to educate the community on what we were seeing, you know, what we were seeing on this map. What were the, the, the health um, outcomes that were really concerning to us? And so through that process of um, input and conversation, um, we moved forward, we started to move forward with a model of putting these health centers in um, these vacant apartment units. And so um, we, you know, we, we sought input from tenant councils and we um, really took the lead of, of the housing authority who said, you know, these are the units, um, we are, we'd love to give them to you in kind, we'll pay for utilities, we'll even pay for some renovations, which was pretty remarkable. We were not expecting that degree of generosity. Um, and, and we went from there and Amy, do you want to jump in with the, to the second half there? Yeah, sure. Um, and so once we had the clinics up and running, the one day a week, we realized we have this renovated space here all the time. Why don't we use it? Um, and so a combination of that, a combination of I was starting my internship at the health department and in grad school spent a lot of time really researching community advocates, health workers, and the benefit they have for our community. Um, and then through that, once the clinics had started, we also um, have developed very specific relationships with five medical homes in Richmond uh, where we have a designated coordinator. We call them directly. They set up appointments for our clients, um, and then our community advocates follow up with them to make sure that they went. Um, and that's been really helpful. We don't have to press one, press two anymore to make an appointment. And they also keep track of, of the visits and the patients that come as well. Um, and then, of course, funding partnerships. How do we make this run? And we'll get a little bit more into that as we go along, too. And, you know, one thing we'd want you to take from this snapshot is that this project was an evolution over time, right? We started with this expansion grant that allowed us to put some health services. And as residents got engaged and said, here's what we see, here's what we want, um, and, and we move towards the community health worker model, um, the breadth of partners and services that ended up, that, that currently exist, uh, evolved over time. And as we get into some of this nitty gritty, again, please stop and ask questions along the way. Um, so here's a quick snapshot, this is smaller, but in 2008 is when we received the Title X funding. It's a three-year grant. Um, in 2009, in November, is when the first one opened in Fairfield. Uh, 2010, uh, March, we received funding from the Community Foundation. I put that on there because that was a very pivotal moment for us. Here was a local foundation partnering with us. So we had the, the three-year grant, we had the health department behind us, the housing authority, but here was a, a local funder that was willing to put some oomph behind it. Um, and then in May, we opened our second resource center. Um, and then in December, again, two more agencies gave us funding. Um, at that point, we knew the Title X funding was going to end. We needed that support. But the, the first local funder, the Community Foundation, was, gave us that oomph, I think, to receive that, that extra funding. So at that point in December 2010, we knew we were alive and kicking and we could keep going. Uh, in March of 2011, lots happened. The Title X funding ended, but because we had um, the new partners, um, we could open the Creighton Resource Center. Uh, we also hired our first community advocates. Um, in April, the Mosby Resource Center opened. We worked on some more funding. Two years later, uh, two months ago, we opened up our fifth one in Hillside. <laughs> Thanks. Um, here are just some snapshots. Uh, there are six large housing developments in the city of Richmond. We're currently in five of them. They're all very similar in size, range from 450 to 500 units, um, range from a population of 1,200 to 1,500 or so. So about 6,000 residents um, in the housing developments. Um, so this is the Wickham one in May 2010. 
Here's uh, April 2011. The idea through these snapshots, as you can tell, this is what public housing in Richmond looks like. Um, brick uh, two-story buildings. There's about six units per building, um, and we are are in one, as you are in them, as you can tell. So this is what would be a bedroom where we've painted the walls, hung some pictures, put in an exam table. Um, the average clinic size, 800 to 900 square feet. So three of our centers are one-bedroom apartments, one is two-bedroom, and one is five-bedroom, the Cadillac one. Um, I'll add real quick, one of the cool um, examples of community engagement in, in getting to this point, um, it may seem like a small thing, but as we were engaging residents and tenant councils, um, we kind of said, what do you guys want it to look like? What, what color do you want to paint the walls? What art do you want to see up in there? And that just, it was an amazing step of saying, this is yours, what do you want to do with it? And for folks who had lived in public housing, in some cases, for generations, mm -hmm. um, having different color walls and, and getting to put stuff up on the wall was, was really mind-blowing for them. Right. Yeah. So with the, with the collaboration for the Denver Housing Authority, we had a four-bedroom uh, uh, accessible unit that we made into a, a clinic. And then they also gave us a, a four-bedroom, uh, another four-bedroom unit that we utilized as a, a, a mental health center. So being right there, right smack in the middle of the development was, is huge because, I mean, now we're in a larger clinic that's just right down the street, but it's not the same. It's, you, don't, you don't have uh, the accessibility that you have uh, the one-on-one -on -one with residents when you can go outside the door and make a barbecue or have a Christmas party just right outside the door. And it, being in a clinic, in a larger clinic, it's just, it's changed a lot. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate you saying that. Sometimes in our small space, we get a little claustrophobic or we say, I wish we had bigger space, but that would mean moving outside the community, you're right. Um, and we do get that neighborhood feel. I mean, we have neighbors, we share walls, and um, you know, safety comes up a lot. And I say, you know, our neighbors call when they notice we've left the lights on, or I dropped a big box one time, and the neighbor ran next, necked on the door. You know, are you okay? Yes, I just dropped a box. So there really is that community feel, and you do feel like you have neighbors, um, you know, who share and who give and take. And that's I really uh, appreciate that. All right. So one of the things that I want to clarify is that the services that are provided in these resource centers, it's not comprehensive primary care. Um, when we first went in there, you know, we thought about what, what are the issues that are going on in our city? Uh, you know, access to care is something that's talked about everywhere. Um, and what we, at least in the, in the cluster of public housing that we started in, there was actually an FQHC that served that neighborhood. Um, there were uh, private practitioners in the community. There was a large academic center within walking or busing distance for some of those residents. And so um, we wanted to be really careful to not piss those folks off and to come alongside them and say, we're not here to compete with you. We want to help bring this healthcare system together. And so the model that we really moved forward with initially was to be a gateway to the healthcare system, to be a point of access for the residents in these communities and help them to first to help us understand what was keeping them from having a primary care medical home, how, what was keeping them from accessing the doctor on a re regular basis, was it education, was it trust, was it money, was it transportation, and in some cases it was all of those things, right? Um, and, and that's what we learned in the process. And so um, the, the services that we provide were initially were really limited to what we do with the health department, which is not primary care, it's family planning, immunizations, uh, a little bit of maternity care for the uninsured, um, STD diagnosis and treatment, a few other things, some chronic disease screening, but that, um, that is, is where we started and, and things have, and, and even some of that evolved over time. Um, our staffing model, so we, these centers are open five days a week, but they're only open for clinical services because as you saw the numbers, we're not talking about huge neighborhoods, especially when we talk about cities on the scale of San Francisco or Denver. You know, these are really small, um, pretty well contained neighborhoods. And so uh, what we did was we, we opened these centers five days a week. One day a week, we provide clinical services that's staffed by a public health nurse, a nurse practitioner, um, and a medical assistant slash clerk that kind of makes the operational side of this run. And then we have a community health worker, someone that we've hired from the community who, um, who is in there, uh, sometimes they're out and about, but uh, you know, they're, they're kind of working out of that site the other five days a week. Um, and all of that organizational structure reports up through the health department. Um, 
And here are the list of services provided. I'll really just kind of focus on the big categories. I've, I've just gone over reproductive health and family planning, uh, STD and HIV prevention, chronic disease screening, uh, health education, some clinical training that we provide to our academic partners. And, th and the bulk of what we do is that service referral and navigation piece. It's, it's connecting with people, figuring out what needs they um, have and, and who in the community can provide that, and then connecting the dots. Um, so medical homes, medical specialties, behavioral health, oral health, um, and, and even getting access to Medicaid. Um, here's just some four key points. Um, we measure kind of a whole slew of things, but uh, so in 2012, we saw uh, 2190 unduplicated um, patients, and those patients, some of them came more than once, so a total of almost 3,000 patient visits, and that's at the four sites um, before we open this fifth one. Uh, we had 3,400 community resource referrals. I'll get into that in a second. And of those, 534 were to a medical home. Um, so hopefully that gives you a snapshot of what that is. Um, here, again, not that you would know the individual people, but our partners are, that's, that's what makes it happen. So we have, of course, the financial support. We have the in-kind donations. Um, the housing development is one of those. Other agencies that come and provide support. So we have um, someone from our Department of Social Services actually come on site once a week to provide her services. Um, we have the Richmond Behavioral Health Authority, which provides our mental health, actually comes on site uh, once a month to provide her services. Um, community partners, educational support. Um, so we don't do a lot of our own specific education. We bring in partners to do the teaching and do the facilitating. That way the health outreach workers can really focus on connecting with people. Um, plenty of referring agencies. So there's our list of medical homes that we refer to. Um, and then service providers. We have two agencies that come in to provide our HIV testing. They're the certified HIV counselors. They do the 20 minute test um, and they come in every week to do that. Um, here's kind of a list of the breadth of our community resource referrals. They range from the crisis interventions, I need food, I need clothing, to more of the development ones of I'm ready to think about a job, I'm ready for, to get some job training. Uh, the Housing Authority does give some funding for people who can apply to get their GED training to get um, some tuition met. Um, but that happens once, so we want to get someone to a place where they can really succeed at that one shot. Um, I, I guess one thing I'd just add to that is that as you see this big list of things that our, our folks are doing, when I talk about the fact that this grew really organically, um, that, I think that's really evidenced here. You know, we didn't go in outside of the, the kind of menu of clinical services that we were going to provide. Um, these needs were, were what the residents were coming to the community health workers with. And um, our community health workers are generalists, which is different than a lot of models around the country. When we looked at the literature around community health workers, usually they're really disease specific. We train people to um, do cancer prevention or to do... Um, you know, heart disease work. And, and so that's something we're trying to figure out is where do we go from here? It's, it's, it's hard to broaden the skill set of some of these community health workers. And so do we create different tracks? And we'll talk about that a little bit more and when we get to community health yeah, workers. Yeah, I'll just say, you know, the goal is that they focus on the referrals, but it is tempting to get into all these areas. We really try to say focus on the referrals, let the other agencies who are already doing these things do what they do, and that we can be the conduit, we can be the bridge, but that way we're not spreading ourselves too thin. That's something we get into a lot. Yes, ma'am. Dental van, yeah, that was the question. Um, that's a good question. Yeah, the dental van is a program that we have run, the health department has run for about five years. It's a mobile, it's a 40-foot RV that we outfitted to provide dental services. So um, we have two dental operatories. It, it um, drives around different parts of the city. It's somewhere new every day. It provides uh, free dental care to uninsured adults, emergent dental care, so extractions, fillings, things like that that are causing acute pain. Yeah. Um, okay, so medical home referrals is just a little bit about how we established these. Um, we identify participating medical homes. Um, we started since four of our clinics are in the East End, and that was our four uh, first clinics. Um, we really focused on where can people actually get to? Can you walk? Can you take the bus? That sort of thing. Um, we had MOUs, medic. Uh, um, memorandums of understanding, uh, where we actually wrote out a contract to say, you have a designated person, 
We will report back and forth to each other. Um, we, each patient signs a confidentiality form saying we can exchange information with this medical home. Um, like I said, the, the agency personnel, uh, there was a lot of staff training um, in terms of how do you make that phone call, how do you make that follow up, um, and referral tracking. Um, I'll just spend a little bit of time talking about it, and I can more if that's of interest. But originally, we were doing it by paper. You know, each advocate would write down the name and where they went, and when we went to do reporting, that was a nightmare. So um, we have transferred that to Access, Microsoft Access. Um, one of our employees at the health department helped us write that. You want to add? The quick take home message is that you guys know this as well as that. This system is insanely right. difficult to navigate. And right. so by having these MOUs in place, by having designated agency personnel, by creating those pathways where like, I can call someone up and say, hey, so-and-so is coming to you tomorrow. Can you take care of them? It's just, it's, it's kind of leapfrog the complexity of that system. Sure, yep. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I'll speak to that. So we make sure everyone knows we, everyone, oh yeah, the question was, what do we do with confidentiality, with lease agreements, with getting in the nitty gritty of that? Um, it has been very important that we tell the residents we are a very separate agency. So nothing about our residents goes to the housing authority. They don't, all that they want to know is numbers, so we report every month how many people are coming, what type of educational classes are happening, but there is nothing that they see a part of the medical record. So that confidentiality form is between the health department and the clinic, the health clinic. Um, and the information we go back and forth is typically name, address, when is your appointment. We don't even get into, we don't need to get into what the primary care center diagnoses somebody with either. Um, so we just try to stick with that basic information. But that was huge in the beginning we had to really clarify we are not the housing authority. I think for good reason, I mean, that's, there we're just separate entities, so we're each focusing on those two things. Sure, yeah, the question is about substance abuse or when we notice somebody's on the brink of eviction, do we get involved? It is a, um, yes, we can definitely get in tricky situations or someone thinks that their landlord is treating them unfairly or we um, do have, play an interesting role, kind of an intermediary role between the housing authority and residents, sure. Um, yes, we do, you know, as we get to know people, as the community advocates know someone, you know, they are gonna speak truth to them to say, hey, you're getting close to this, or hey, remember how they gave you this warning last time? Warning only happens once, you know, the next time you may be evicted. Um, we certainly, we um, have established, an, and as we've had a relationship with the housing authority, we know the best people to kind of connect with to say this is the situation where do we go from here you know we have a scope of property managers just like where you would any facility um, you have I'm a nurse we have a scope of nurses you know who um, range on that scale of wanting to help to not being as helpful um, so we we do have to walk that thin line sometimes and it um, points to why the community health worker model is mm -hmm. so important because that message sounds really different from a peer than it does from the housing right. authority so right. we we're in that situation all the time. Right. Yep. Um, the video covered these briefly. I won't go into them, but I, I will say that um, being nominated and selected for awards has helped our visibility tremendously. So as you guys are thinking about building programs, growing programs, funding programs, um, getting, getting folks, friends, partners in the community to nominate you for things like this goes a long way. Um, and so us been, being able to march out these different awards, take them to our city council and say, look, this is a nationally recognized model, um, has really translated into success. Um, you know, not only have we uh, been really successful from a, a local foundational perspective, um, you know, we, we've gotten grants from three of the big foundations that serve the greater Richmond area, and, and we've gotten those annual re annually renewed, um, which is huge because when, when I got to, to this role, these folks wouldn't fund government. Um, they said, you know, well, you guys get money. Why would we, why would we want to give it to you? And so in cultivating these really innovative, innovative for Richmond, um, private-public partnerships, in um, conveying the importance of the work we do, in doing the relational development with the boards of these foundations and um, just getting to know folks, uh, they came to see the health department as a real leader and an authority figure o o over uh, community health work. So um, I, I put that in there just as a model to you guys. That this is something that's, as you're, as you're thinking about building a program, 
getting national recognition is, is really important. Um, some of our funding has also come from organizations. You know, in addition to cultivating relationships with our local foundations, we've also said, all right, who else serves to benefit by the presence of these centers? We have three large health systems in the greater Richmond metro area. Um, two of them have come on board in pretty significant ways. Bon Secours, um, we had, they have a hospital in the east end, the part of the city that four of our centers are in. Um, and one of them in particular, they said, you know what? This seems like a great opportunity for us as a health system to create a pathway from Creighton Court to community, Richmond Community Hospital. Um, and so they have funded it outright. They have given us $50,000 a year to make that happen, and we're, we're sitting down with them in a couple weeks to up that, because our annual operating cost is about $80,000 per site, including the community health worker costs. So, um, and, and they've, they've, they've done that for now, we're in the third year of that funding. Virginia uh, VCU School of Nursing, um, you know, we said, well, how can VCU benefit from what we're doing? And as we'll talk about in a second, um, it's that those academic partnerships are creating great educational opportunities for nursing students. And so they've uh, come to the table with $25,000 a year, and, and again, we're gonna go after, go after more because we're providing an important service to them. Um, other funding sources, you know, we've just figured out who are our other partners who care about this work. Let's get in on grants that they're writing for. Um, and, and part of what we'll talk about at the end of this that, that plays into the, the, the role we've had in, in helping change the city is, um, you know, we have in, in some ways become a gateway to these communities for a lot of these partners that have struggled for years to try to access um, residents of public housing. And by having folks on the ground as community health workers who, who are really rooted in relationship, um, it's, it's like exploded uh, the success of our partners' grant writing. And you know, we literally, like every week or every other week, get a request from somebody in the community who says, hey, we'd love to write you into this grant. How can we partner with you so that we can um, meet the needs of this population? Um, so that segues us into academic partnerships. And uh, I, I think, you know, for me, being a faculty at VCU and having come from a lot of education, academic partnerships are really important to, to me. To, um, and it's one of our core functions in public health. You know, one of the, the main things we do is assure a competent public health workforce. And so um, we've looked at all of the work we do, and, and specifically the work in the resource centers, as a way to train public health professionals and give them um, frontline access to, to the residents. But, but um, to, to break the mold of what's happened for decades where um, you know, the, the academic institution has related with the community has really been um, hurtful in many ways. Um, and so by engaging them in relationship and uh, in, in a longitudinal relationship um, to understand the impact of the old way of doing things and the benefit of the new way of doing things. And w one of those ways, when we came on board with the School of Nursing, their community health clinical, which is required for every undergraduate who's completing their bachelor's in nursing, uh, was a classroom model, um, which kind of sounds, how is that possible? How can you do community health in the classroom? But that's the way that it was. There, was some, there wasn't really good partnerships. Uh, each student had to spend six hours a semester in the community. That was it. Um, so we, we worked with the School of Nursing to say, hey, why don't you get community health clinical actually in the community? Um, so that's been a really neat process for us to walk through. And now um, we have three different community clinicals uh, working in the resource centers each semester. It's about 10 students um, a site. But we do have to be very careful about how we do that, engage the residents. You know, the residents know that you actually are the teachers to these students who are learning how to engage, how to have hands-on experience with the, with the patients that they interact with the hospital, to learn that each patient has a family and a background background and a culture. Um, so that's been a really important part of what we've done. Uh, we've worked with a variety of students. Um, and not only do they learn, but it's really helpful for us who, um, you know, we have a pretty lean staff. We have two nurses, uh, two nurse practitioners, six community advocates. So there's not too many of us to complete this work. And so the students can come on and can learn, but could also complete a project in a semester. Um, we have a student who's our social work student in one of our clinics. Um, the Masters of Public Health student this year is the one that wrote our um, electronic program for referrals. So they've been really a mutual beneficial um, process in doing that. Um, Here's just two specific examples. Two students who graduated from VCU, uh, you saw in the video, um, are now a part of the, um, of the resource center and as, out of the health department. Uh, the top one, Courtney, uh, was, in, was my student two years ago, uh, graduated and then was um, passionate about public health um, and became a part of the staff. So. 
So the last. Maybe, should we just stop? Any any questions sure. before we're going to jump into this community advocate piece? But good question is what the demographics of public housing are. Ninety-eight percent African American in the city of Richmond. Mm -hmm. Yes, the rest of my staff is. So the, peers. the peers are all, yep, and we'll get into that. I know, maybe we should have put the picture first. But um, it's a very important question. Mm -hmm. As we're interested in recruiting clinicians of color, not peer counselors, you know, we're, we're uh, trying to start a black men's clinic. And we'd like to have a black man <laughs> to take care of them, not just peer counselors. And so I'm just interested in recruitment strategies. We've had difficulty with that. And, and now, I mean, you know, we serve people, but our clinicians are mainly white women. And, and the residents have expressed concern about that. Not that they won't come because they need services, but they don't get the same benefit that they're looking for. And so that's why I asked. Actually, let me take this before you. So the National Center will be conducting a webinar, I believe it's next week, on how to recruit and retain culturally diverse staff. So look for your email. I think it goes out tomorrow at some point. I'm really glad you asked that question. That's really important, and you know we'll continue to speak to that. Um, yeah, our staff of 12 or 14, um, I am the only Caucasian, and that is really important in a city when you serve 98%, but it is not easy. I'm in the process of hiring someone else and trying to work that out because it's really tough. Not only is it really tough to hire community advocates who live in public housing but can be trusted with confidential information, who can communicate with their peers, but it is also um, with nurses and nurse practitioners as well. Um, did Look for your residents and uh, your leaders in your community because their uh, uh, residents will look up to them and trust them. So that's that's key. Yeah, and that's you know that's the heart of I think the, the community health worker approach is is finding those indigenous leaders and, and they have the relationships, they have the respect and the trust of the community and, and that's how we've been able to do anything that we've done right. is because we've um, been blessed with really great folks on the ground. Yeah. So, um, Another quick piece with that too is just trying to, the current situation I'm in is about salary. You know, how do I spend money less other places so I can hire this person and, and pay her what she wants because she's someone who can connect with the culture. Um, but that has been a part of our success. We didn't point out, but the picture that had the two women, one holding a baby, um, she's, I think she's in her 60s, she's got dreads, um, and she's a nurse practitioner, and she can communicate. I mean, you see our community advocate, our clerical specialist even grew up in um, public housing, doesn't anymore, communicates well. Then you come see me, I'm clearly different than that, and then you go see Michelle, who's got dreads. I mean, you've got, uh, someone's gonna communicate along the way, um, but I, I think it's a really important piece that you bring up. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. I have a question. Uh, what is your relationship, since you say you work in the community, especially is it 90 percent, 80 percent African, with the um, African American community leaders, as far as well, partnership with them, as well as the public school system? Um, so, uh, different, a few different pieces of that question. Uh, our relationship with African American community, community leaders. Uh, at the big, at the outset of this work, we um, were really intentional about elected officials, our city council folks, our school board folks, about the African American docs who have been serving this community for decades, um, and and letting them know who we are, making sure that they um, understand what role we play and how we're coming alongside them to to bring patients to them. Um, so it's a it's a really important point and honoring. Um, the, the African American leaders in the community and, and what they've done for, for these residents for decades, especially in a city like Richmond, um, had to happen. And I, I imagine that's true for some of the places that you guys are, are living as well. So we've been really uh, thoughtful and, you know, we haven't done it perfectly and we've made missteps and we learn from them, um, but it is a, a core part of our approach to engaging this community. Um, and, and to that point, you know, 
part of why I think Amy and I um, have, have done this and wanted to share it, you know, this is deeply personal to, to both of us. You know, my wife and, and our family and Amy and her husband and her family um, both independently moved into an inner city community. I've been there nine years and you guys, what, six years, seven years? Um, and, and part of, as I said, this work, this work of justice and racial reconciliation um, is, is, is a, you know, it's, it's so meaningful to us, and so that um, the the work that's happening in these public housing communities, we, we actually live in the, the non-public housing communities that abut um, some of these public housing um, neighborhoods. Um, and so it really spills out in every way, you know, in terms of what we're dealing with day in, day out in our own family lives and who our neighbors are and what we're, they're dealing with. You know, my, my neighbors typically are kind of the step out of public housing. They come and they live in our neighborhood um, when they've gotten out of public housing. And so, you know, I, I bring that up to say that um, some of the principles that have come into this relationship approach to community health workers and, and um, De the asset-based asset development concept, really empowering indigenous leaders and training them up um, and, and looking at them to lead all of this work, um, that undergirds everything that we do in, in our community health worker program. So I just wanted, I wanted to start there as we head into this. Um, and just a little bit about my role. Danny at the health department does a lot of the big picture um, and a lot of the support. And so my role has been um, kind of on the ground, the management of this and the development of the advocate program. And like so many of you, this has been a lot, this is a lot of me coming out, um, but we aren't perfect and we have made mistakes along the way. And I really appreciate some of this real dialogue. So as we go along, please keep it up. Um, so creation of the, of the Community Advocate Initiative, as I mentioned, we wanted it to be used in the community. We wanted the resident's voice. Um, we had seen some instances where it worked, but as Danny said, nothing had really been, we hadn't read anything about the community advocate per community rather than the community advocate per disease. Um, so this was a different way to say, this is your specific neighborhood. Um, get to know the people here, know where they live, know who they are. Um, Recruitment, as we've talked about, can be difficult. What we did is we went to some of the surrounding coalitions. There's a couple in Richmond around different topics. We went to tenant councils. Um, there's an AmeriCorps program in Richmond that develops some people, um, some leaders. So we had interviews. We interviewed 25 people for four spots um, to get a whole you know, idea of who was out there, what they were passionate about. Um, we were looking for someone who either lived in public housing or right outside, really knew the community. Um, yeah, strategic hiring, like we said, you know, four out of 25, you know, we really have wanted to, to make sure we picked right people. Um, there are six advocates right now, an additional three haven't worked out for various reasons, which I'd be happy to go into at another point, but it's been, it's been quite a learning process. Um, the training, we have ongoing training. Um, we have two staff meetings a month. One of those is just dedicated to training. That's a whole range of disease-specific information, customer service, um, computer use. Um, role modeling, any one of those kind of range of topics. Um, there's a lot of accountability that goes on. Um, there's one-on-one -on -one meetings with each staff. So myself and um, Stephanie is the other public health nurse kind of divide up the team. Um, we meet each month, as I said, um, the staff meetings, I said, drop-in visits, uh, there's monthly reports. Uh, it's a difficult role. Most of the time, the community advocate spends on their own, either doing outreach or being there in the clinic for the referrals and the resources. So um, it's been a development process. Um, for many of them, it's a per their first professional role and first professional job. So um, it's kind of the scope of um, someone starting, learning about professionalism and dress and coming on time. Um, but the thing we don't have to teach is how how do you communicate and how do you connect with your peers? And that's what's so beautiful to see. Um, quick story, you know, a teen comes in who she says, I want to be pregnant. I'm 16, I want to be pregnant. You know, I bring her in, I sit down, talk about education. You know, she walks out and the community advocate talks to her, you know, for about a minute and she stands up and leaves and says, oh yeah, you made a lot of sense. I'm like, great, um, I'll see you later. You all just continue. But it's really beautiful to see that connection and someone gets to hear the, the health piece, but someone also gets to hear from their peer about the health choices they're making. Um, and then vision building, I think, is the most important one uh, to really keep everyone's focus on the big picture, on how we're affecting change for the community. So when I ask for a monthly report or when I say we have a meeting, you know, I try to bring it back into how what we're doing really brings health to the broader community and how that we, having a high standard, doing a good job at what we're doing, really help to bring about that health. 
Um, here's some challenges. We have plenty of them. Uh, as I mentioned, the lack of professional work experience. Um, lack of resource center staff dedicated to the supervision of the advocate. So as I mentioned, the other nurse and I are staffing the clinics, um, trying to get funding, building partnerships, and supervising at the same time. So that's certainly been a challenge. There hasn't, we haven't been able to give as much as we've wanted to um, to some of the advocates because of the many different things we're trying to do. Um, legal and cr criminal backgrounds. Um, some of our staff have had um, criminal backgrounds, and so in this state, if it's been more than five years, uh, then you're able to be hired through the health district. But we had to figure out that process and, and make sure that um, we could make that happen. Um, of course, generational poverty that I don't have to go very much into, but you know, when residents are being um, ousted by their own family for wanting to get the GED, for wanting to go back to school because do you think I'm better than you? You all could speak to that more than me. It's a really tough thing to come up against when you have someone who wants to make it and so how do you encourage someone in that? Um, family structures are difficult. Um, all of the staff are single, all except one, are single moms. Um, so trying to keep up with what they need to do to take care of their kids, but at the same time have a clinic open on a regular amount of hours that, that people can come to. Um, and that kind of flows into the personal challenges as well um, with their own backgrounds, with their own medical, social history as well. Many lessons learned. Here's a few. Um, lack of thorough reference checks. So call many, many, many people about individuals. That's very helpful. Um, inability to address diverse and multifaceted community needs. And that speaks to, there is so much need. How do you create a position that begins to start working with some of them? So that's what we really focus on. The community advocate does outreach, referrals, classes. Those are the three things. And it's very easy to get sidetracked. They don't teach the classes. They just come up with the topics for them. So really trying to make it a very specific role, but there's a lot of need. Um, lack of evidence, as we mentioned, for a general um, community advocate role. Um, difficulties in creating a new role. So when we started three years ago to what it looks like now has changed. Now I can stand before you and tell you these three things, but that wasn't like that in the beginning. So the staff has had to be flexible as we've moved along and, and changed the role to what the community needed and what was, what was happening. Um, need for constant flexibility, as I said. Um, all the centers, um, the, the hour, each, each center, the hours are consistent, but they're not the same as other centers based on what the outreach worker can work, based on what her needs of her family are. Um, I didn't mention this, but speaking of her, all of our out, uh, community advocates are female, so there's another difficulty. We don't have men um, that are on, in the role. Uh, necessity of regular evaluation. So I think in a, in a normal role, you're probably evaluated at six months and then just yearly. Um, but we have, depending on the person, much more frequent evaluations of, of the individual. Um, overcoming challenges, goal setting has been really helpful, um, work, work goals and personal goals together. Um, frequent trainings, as I've mentioned, encouraging feedback and suggestions of the staff. So at all the staff meetings, you know, we want the, the staff to also, everyone's talking at the same time, what has worked, what's not worked, um, what's difficult, what's working, um, so that we can really focus on team. Um, maintaining high expectations, as I said, you know, we can be flexible, but really holding that high standard of when you come to work, being on time, being ready to work. Um, fostering individuals and strengths of the, of the community advocates. Um, all the classes, again, each center is consistent, but they're different based on what the advocate wants to provide. I have one advocate who loves line dancing, so she teaches line dancing. I have another advocate very into nutrition and gardening, so she does that at that center. Another advocate that came up with Biggest Loser, everybody brings a dollar at the end of 10 weeks. Whoever wins, wins $20. Um, so it looks different based on what that advocate is excited about pursuing. Um, providing role models for the community advocates. Um, women who have our, our, the woman who is our city council representative in our district, there are seven districts in the city of Richmond, she actually grew up in Wickham Court, um, which is one of the housing developments we're in, and she's now city council, and so she's a great role model, she's come to speak to our advocates. Um, but a whole slew of women who have come in to say, here's where I am, here are the challenges I've faced. There's a pediatrician in the neighborhood who had a baby at age 16, and she's a pediatrician. So bringing in women who can really speak to, I've been in a really tough place, here I am, and that encourages the advocates to say, I've also been in a hard place and come along the way um, and to encourage other people. 
Um, strategic impact, improved clinical outcomes, so you heard mentioned on the video, but we are seeing slow improvement in some of our um, health information. Um, we've kind of kept track over the last three or four years and we're seeing, we're seeing improvement. Um, education of students and researchers. We've talked about students, the education of students, but also researchers. As Danny mentioned, we have a lot of, um, we're very close to VCU and we have a lot of good intention resource researchers, um, some more than others, that want to come in and, and do research about a whole slew of things and the advocates really serve as that gate Keeper. So I go to them and say, hey, this person is interested in doing this in the neighborhood. Should we, should we even hang up a sign? And they kind of let us know, oh, I don't know, or let's, go, let's get to know more information, or yes, I do see a, a clear benefit to the residents through this research. Um, community advocates becoming role models for the community, as I mentioned. Um, uh, two of them live in public housing, four of them have lived and live right outside the communities, um, so they can, they can really speak to their residents about the choices they've made. Um, it was briefly mentioned this morning, but you know, we're all, we have to toe that line of not making the community advocates poorer than they were on government assistance. So that's a really tricky line. Another reason for the varying in hours and the varying in, because each person is individual. So I guess that's another thing to say is that it's very individualized on that each community advocate. Um, professional development of community advocates, um, and then conduits for community change. Um, so here's a picture of Naisha and her son Nigel and Naisha's mom. Uh, they lived across the street from us in Fairfield uh, when we moved in four years ago. Um, Naisha, since then, she did Job Corps for a year, um, got her welding certificate, came out, got a job, has moved out of public housing. Um, so she and her family are um, one of the examples of, as our community advocates have checked in and communicated along the way. There was a time where she almost got evicted. We did that. Um, it's, you know, as we've come along this way, um, really seeing, you know, the community change. Uh, yeah, here's Shinari Hall. Here's one of our community advocates. Um, a quote, she says, it's more than just service provision. It's about building trust and building relationships, as well as about building people up, realizing their needs and helping them achieve their goals. And Shinari actually, so we started the program um, so two and a half years ago. We kind of said to the advocates then, Think about this as a two to three year role, and then after that, what are you going to do next? You know, are you going to go back to school? Are you going to do another, you know, job? Are you, where, what's your next step in life? And so Shinari's um, leaving with us a week and a half, and she's going to VCU School of Social Work in the fall. So that's, that's our goal, is that this is kind of the building blocks to that next step in life um, of running, <laughs> running your own nonprofit or dreaming big, whatever that is, um, and helping them reach those personal goals along the way. Another um, woman, uh, she's, anyway, again, her hours are different because she's doing um, part-time back to school at our community college too. So we want to encourage those steps along the way. We see it as workforce development, you know, as the community is changing, but the community advocates are growing as well. Um, so as we come to the end, um, and I, uh, I think about that title again, and, and how, how do we feel like we've been a part of changing our city through this project, through the resource centers and our investment in public housing. And there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of little things, you know, I mentioned like the, the local funding community now funding government. There's a lot of little things like that um, that have changed kind of the cultures and the habits of our city. Um, but I, I think the most profound things, you know, there's three things that come to mind. One, in our academic partnerships, we have become a conduit for the entire academic community in Richmond um, to really uh, do service learning in the way that it was meant to be and to really foster meaningful relationships between students and residents in a way that's really truly mutual. Um, that I think that's something that obviously was missing from a, a simulation community experience community experience at the School of Nursing, um, but has now uh, profoundly impacted not just the School of Nursing, but a lot of different graduate and undergraduate programs um, in the city. The second thing um, is, and Amy just kind of talked ab about um, what it's meant to the individual community health workers, the folks who have been hired from their communities, who have been trained with a skill set, um, who have now become role models in their own community. Um, and as we kind of think about the Affordable Care Act and where it's heading with potential reimbursement streams for this type of work, um, you know, we have, have now become kind of the go-to folks from, you know, our, our partners in the community to say, okay, how, how are you guys doing this? How can we do it with you? Um, and, and we're looking at this as the platform to build out our care coordination and, and patient navigation um, for the entire city. Um, and then the third thing, I think, um, certainly, 
you know, on a, on a medical level, shifting the culture away from, so there's actually four things, but um, shifting culture away from the emergency room to primary and preventive care, you know, this is a, a, a pressing need in every community that we're talking about. When we talk about health resource utilization, um, and this has been a huge focus for our community health workers, and so we're in the process of working with our health systems to start tracking that specific data, and I, you know, I went to a presentation that Andy gave this morning where they've done a really great job of, of um, showing how asthma community health workers have decreased ED utilization. And so um, that's where we're trying to get on, on the city scale. Um, and then the last thing I would say, and I, I kind of started with this a little bit, but um, the whole concept of asset-based community development and really um, valuing what each individual has to offer in whatever place they are um, and, and affirming and empowering that so that they can grow into leaders uh, to be able to serve their own communities. Um, you know, through this work over the last three to four years, um, we again have kind of become the partner that um, our housing authority and our health systems and our FQHCs are coming to um, to say, how are you guys doing this and how can we be involved? And so, um, you know, we don't want to think of it as, as, a, as a gatekeeper necessarily, but more of, um, a, a, I said gateway, even though we talk about the gateway to the healthcare system, as, as a way for our community at large to interact with our public housing residents in a really um, respectful and honoring way. So we will end with that and open it up for um, any last minute questions. We've got about five, ten minutes left, I think. When I first started um, being a medical assistant and just uh, somebody from the community, I was uh, cross-trained. I was cross-trained in checking patients in, uh, working the front desk, doing home visits, um, uh, outreach, uh, lab. I was cross-trained in, in all aspects of, of the clinic of, that we were in, but uh, that really helped. and. So that's just an idea of, you know, to get residents, uh, to get whoever you've got working for you, get cross-trained to get to know all the details of the, of the job. Yeah, appreciate you saying that. Okay, I just want to say you presented a lot of good information today. I've learned a lot, but you went through it rather quickly. Is it possible to get a copy of your presentation? All of the presentations will be made available on the website. So everybody's going to get an email at the end of this that says what website you can go to to access these slides. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Or, and also, you know, here's our contact information if you want to write down those email addresses, and we'd be happy to ha foster a further conversation as well. I know. We both forgot our cards. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right. I know there's more. Give us, give us challenges. Thank you for your presentation. Your community health advocates, some of them may um, have grown up inside the public housing community, but are you deploying them to a different work community than where they're living? Um, that's the goal that they focus where they have the relationship. So, uh, for example, one woman lived in Creighton 15 years, moved out about three years ago um, kind of to, to Section 8 housing, which Maybe the same here. It's kind of the next step, uh, but still has all of those relationships. So that's kind of what I mean. If some of them have taken that next step, um, maybe living just outside their community, but still have those relational connections to the, the community. Um, and then we do have two who still live in their neighborhoods. Does that answer your question? In your state, uh, what is the the age for birth control? Like in California, children 12 and up. What, what's that like there? Yeah, it's 12 and up in Virginia as well. There are laws around um, reporting around minors that sometimes complicate that. I mean, we can we can provide services to 12 and up, but we are required to report um, under 16. No? Okay, under 14. Well, please keep this conversation going. If you all think of other questions later, please um, come up to us, and thank you for your time. Thanks so much. Thank